All right. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody to Freedom All San Diego's fourth political education workshop. Uh, tonight, uh, we I wanted to call it resisting medical abuse and neglect and detention. It didn't quite fit on the flyer. Um, <laughs> but the spirit tonight is not just that we'll be talking about medical abuse and neglect and detention, but we'll be talking about the, the efforts to resist um, abuse and neglect um, and to, both on the inside and folks on, on the outside working in solidarity with organizers. Um, just a couple of quick logistics. Uh, this event will be recorded tonight, except for when we move into small breakout rooms. So if you do, don't want to be visible on the recording, please turn off your camera whenever you're speaking. Um, also, uh, many of us have been to Zoom meetings by now, but uh, you know that keeping your microphone muted during the presentations will make it so that we can hear what the speaker has to say and not your conversation, <laughs> side conversation. Um, if you do have a question or a comment, please post it in the chat and one of our uh, coalition members will um, will answer for you or, or uh, share it with me and I'll, I'll share it with our, our panelists today. If you haven't been to one of these events before, one of these events before, we are a coalition of organizations and activists based in the San Diego Tijuana border region. We're committed to affirming migration as a human right. To achieve this, we uh, are building for a world without cages, border walls, armed enforcers, and institutions built upon a foundation of white supremacy. Our work starts with closing the Otay Mesa Detention Center and moving on to freeing them all. Some of our values and visions are, we believe in the freedom of movement and that migration is a human right. We stand in solidarity with all migrants, refugees, and those seeking asylum without condition. We struggle for abolition and for building a world without cages, borders, and armed enforcers. We support the decolonization of all occupied lands. We strive to build a democratic movement that is multiracial, multiethnic, gender inclusive, disability inclusive, and welcoming of all faiths. And we center the liberation of the oppressed in all aspects of our organizing. Um, I am part of a subcommittee in the Free Them All San Diego Coalition called the Political Education Committee. And we are uh, using various mediums to invite communities and individuals who are engaged in migrant justice work to share analysis with each other that can build our collective understanding of how to enact the bigger vision of our coalition um, and migrant justice work in general. We've had three past events. Um, and if you uh, weren't able to attend one or more of them, we actually have a YouTube channel which I'm posting in the chat, uh, where those previous events were recorded. Um, so, so please do uh, check it out um, if you weren't able to be there in person. Tonight, uh, our topic is resisting medical abuse and neglect and detention. And this really gets to the core of why we started this coalition in the first place. Um, the coalition was started in April, 2020, uh, almost a year ago now, just a few weeks after the outbreak of COVID-19 in the United States. And it became clear that our compas inside of detention centers were at serious risk of uh, becoming sick and dying. People who had done solidarity work for a, a very long time, uh, we know that Customs and Borders Patrol ICE and the private contractors that ICE contracts with routinely deny necessary medical care to people presenting at the border and people in custody. And there have been many unnecessary deaths um, before the COVID-19 pandemic. And the pandemic has only compounded um, and, and created more unnecessary deaths of people inside. We also know as people who have been doing this work for a long time, that when ICE and contractors moved to stop visits and the immigration courts were shut down, 
that people's mental health was going to suffer and that ICE did not have ways to support uh, people's mental health inside. Uh, as we've learned since starting this uh, coalition, the pandemic has made these ongoing problems much, much worse. And today's speakers are going to give us more context to understand what's happening inside of detention centers and how we can support people who are resisting and demanding better treatment uh, while they're inside. We'll be hearing from uh, Christina Malo, a collective member from a local organization called Detention Resistance. Vanessa Sasenia, who's been a longtime Freedom All San Diego Coalition member and uh, is now the Director of Capacity Building at Border Angels. We'll also be hearing from Marcela Hernandez, Senior Organizer with Detention Watch Network. Um, uh, and I actually have uh, more detailed bios of each of these people that I will give uh, as I present them. Um, so tonight, the agenda for tonight is to hear from each of these uh, speakers, and then we'll actually move into uh, smaller groups, uh, what are called breakout rooms, where we'll invite you to have a smaller conversation with each other about the topic for tonight, and to think about the kind of work that you feel called to do to support migrant justice um, and to stop the abuse and neglect that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, after the breakout rooms, we'll gather back together and uh, have a, a, a large group discussion and we'll be sharing some calls to action at the end of the uh, event tonight. So I'm first going to uh, turn it over to Maria Cristina Malo. Um, who is an organizer with Detention Resistance, whose work is primarily focused on answering calls from detainees at Otay Mesa Detention Center via a hotline that Detention Resistance operates. Um, uh, Maria Cristina also connects COMPAS to community and legal resources, documents and reports abuses, and amplifies COMPAS voices and supports organizing efforts from inside the detention center. So we wanted to hear from you, uh, Christina. Can you describe what's happening inside of Otay Mesa Detention Center? Um, and also how are people organizing for their rights? Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I thought I'd start by, um, I, I wrote down a list of some of the general demands that um, we have um, received from our compas. Um, so you could just have an idea. Um, and then I'll move into some very um, individual narrations um, and examples of, of the things that are happening inside. Um, so some of these demands that COMPAS um, have expressed are they, they want to be seen um, for all of their medical ailments in one visit and not have to sign up for a doctor's visit for each ailment separately. So what this means is if they have three or four ailments happening all at once, they can only sign up for one on like, let's say on Tuesday at five in the morning, they can only sign up for one. And then they have to wait on Wednesday at five o'clock in the morning to sign up for the other one. And then again on Thursday. And if they don't get to sign up around five o'clock in the morning, um, they can't do so the rest of the day. They have to wait, you know, the next day. So it's very limited their access for requesting um, medical support. Um, they want to be able to receive their medications in a timely manner and not have lapses of time where they don't um, have access to their medication um, because it's out of stock or because the pharmaceutical company, um, you know, that C uh, Core Civic outsources to, doesn't doesn't have doesn't carry it at all. Um, they want to be able to continue the medications they were on before entering the detention center, including those who are transferred from state prisons. Um, they want to be seen by spe specialists for their chronic conditions and not just receive uh, pain management, uh, which more often than not is ineffective. Uh, a greater part of the function of their medical clinic is more like a nurse's office that provides like uh, first aid kind of you know, response. Um, they want to be also seen by uh, specialists in a timely manner instead of being told that the process can take weeks or months and they're often left in the dark 
on you know, where they are in the process of being referred to a specialist. Um, again, especially for those who already have pre-existing uh, chronic conditions. Um, they wanna have um, a clear diagnosis and follow-up consultations instead of constantly receiving pain, medic pain medication, which again, and doesn't resolve the root of the conditions they are experiencing. Um, they also ask a lot for eye exams and glasses. Uh, many of them had their eyeglasses with them when they were crossing and their items you know, are taken. There is a lack of protocol in who records the items. Many of the compas do not get their items back, including money. Um, so several of them have a hard time reading the documents that are sent to them or you know anything that that they a lot of them don't have lawyers so they're preparing a lot of these applications and parole and bond requests on their own but they don't even have like you know the basic which is like eyeglasses to be able to read and write um, and advocate for themselves um, they want to have clarity of the process and timeline uh, again this goes back to follow-up tests and treatments um, they also want to, in many instances, be provided with the medical equipment that they need, such as wheelchairs and crutches, um, and especially like if, they, if they've suffered any injuries. Um, they want to be provided with the appropriate amount of hygiene products, such as soap and shampoo and toothpaste and toothbrushes as a way to reduce the uh, spread of infections and viruses especially during this pandemic. Um, and of course, this whole time they've been asking for appropriate PPE um, to prevent you know, the spread of COVID. Um, and of, they also want to halt all transfers in and out of Otay Mesa um, Detention Center in order to decrease the continuous uh, COVID outbreaks that exist there. Um, those are just a few sort of the general demands we have been able um, to gather from our conversations and our documentations with our compas. Um, I'll highlight a few of the situations um, that um, have come to mind in my serving on this hotline. Um, for example, there is a compa who's has been dealing for months with a growing lump in one of, of his testicles. Um, he received an MRI back in August after requesting multiple times and writing grievances, finally was able to get access to this service. Um, as a result of that MRI, he was told he'd be referred to a urologist. In October, the medical care switched to a privatized system um, in which CoreCivic took over in uh, ICE, and so they became the main, um, the main uh, group to oversee medical care. And COMPAS were told that as a result, all of their medical records and pending medical procedures had been wiped out of the system. And anything that was in process for them had to restart over. So this particular COMPA was told he had to again get an MRI and you know, begin the process to then be referred to a urologist. Um, he is experiencing great discomfort. Um, the lump continues to grow. He is very, very concerned. He is yet to get his second, his MRI um, and, and yet to begin the process of, you know, pushing to see a urologist again. Um, another compa uh, was transferred from a state prison. Um, a Several decades ago, he received a gunshot wound to the spine. And at the time of the surgery, he, uh, part of his intestine, his colon was removed as well as his kidney and his gallbladder. Because of this, he suffers from chronic uh, constipation and so needs to take several medications. Well, CoreCivic has told him that his medical record has not been transferred from the state prison that he came from. And so they cannot provide him with the medication that he needs. And he, uh, last time I talked to him, he had um, uh, almost three weeks of constipation. He had been suffering for three weeks. Um, 
and I am waiting for him to send his medical records and I'll speak a little bit of, about that um, in a bit. Um, there was uh, recently there's been a compa who has been denied his prescription medication. Uh, he ran out, but his prescription is still active. And in fact, uh, he is entitled to a refill. But CoreCivic is telling him that he has to get re-diagnosed re in order to get his prescription. Um, and they've told him that uh, the appointment uh, to see a neurologist to get re-diagnosed can take weeks or months. And he's very concerned because he says that his well-being really depends on this medication. Um, I wrote several more things, but I won't, I, you know, I can go on and on. Like these are like real cases happening um, right now, you know, and our compas in the detention center, uh, you know, they're really suffering and being challenged by this um, dehumanizing system. Um, I know the next speaker will talk a little bit about mental health, but that's also an issue. A lot of our so, uh, compas that are su suffering from mental health, their conditions are being exacerbated. One, because they don't have access to the medication they're supposed to have. There's not continuity in the medication. And then of course, they, they are given medication, but they're not offered anything else like psychotherapy or any other thing that would support their conditions. And so because of that, there have also been compas um, who have suffered you know, great injury. Uh, a compa that I talked to was beaten severely by someone who was having an episode and he was left in a wheelchair for, um, for two weeks. So, you know, it's just the intensity of this neglect and abuse is really affecting compas all around. Um, in general, the approach of the medical staff at the detention center is to confuse uh, detainees um, about the medical condition and the medications. Um, to prolong their access to medical care in hopes that compas will stop requesting it. Um, they keep compas in the dark about general protocol, medical protocols and, you know, overall just ignoring, procrastinating, deflecting and sidetracking our uh, tactics that are being used so that our compas do not receive the adequate care that, uh, that they deserve and of course, a uh, big picture is that uh, this neglect and abuse is so severe and it's ultimately on purpose, you know, to wear down the spirits of our compas and so that they can, um, you know, sign their own deportations and stop fighting, you know, for their, for their dignity and their right to a better life. Um, I'd like to give you um, just a little brief look at, uh, we started to, uh, compile phone statistics. Um, and, you know, since early March when the pandemic hit and everything was shut down, our phone lines really started to pick up. Prior to that, um, our hotline was functioning like on a Saturday. Um, and right after that, we went to seven hours a week, um, pretty much like from seven to 10 at night. And the calls just, they've never stopped coming in. Um, we usually, uh, in the data that was amalgamated, we were able to look at um, the total number of calls we received in 2020, and it was 18,743 calls. Um, in December alone, we received 1,268 calls. Um, and this, also, this includes missed, voicemail, and received. And of those 1,268 calls, 94.1% uh, were from Otay Mesa Detention Center. Um, so you can get an idea of the volume of calls that are coming in. Um, other than Sunday, we answer similar numbers of calls each day. And, um, you know, we try to look at which days have um, the most increase, but for the most part, um, all days are really, really, really super busy. Um, and so in receiving all of these calls and having more interaction with our compas, um, 
you know, back in April and May, we supported the hunger strike that was happening inside of the detention center. Um, and let me know if I'm going over time. I'm trying to remember what I'm saying, but also be considerate of the time. Um, we supported the hunger strike that was happening in the detention center, um, connecting our compas to uh, reporters, um, making sure that they're aware of the retaliation, never discouraging them from their work, but important for them to understand the type of retaliation they'll face. And of course, um, always, always letting them take the lead in, in, in their resistance and in their uh, fight for their dignity. Um, we, um, so we supported that, it, the hunger strike, connecting them to reporters, uplifting their voice through our social media. Um, recently, we have um, received training from uh, AFSC um, Vanessa trained us uh, in doing um, uh, civil rights and civil liberty complaint forms for our compas, and we also received training from FFI. So because of that training, we started to fill out, um, again, civil rights, civil liberty complaint forms, and these complaint forms just narrated and detailed the abuse and neglect that individual compas had been facing and were facing. Um, they, we usually collected uh, copies of grievances and any other evidence that COMPAS send us with these forms. Uh, these forms go, uh, are sent directly to the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we also copy them to the warden and assistant warden of either one detention center or the several detention centers they've been at to ICE field officer directors. Um, and usually uh, the civil CRCL complaint forms can be um, due to, they're not just medical stuff, they can do to, be due to anything um, that has to do with detention uh, conditions um, and treatment um, of detainees. Uh, recently, however, we, because we've been receiving more and more medical complaints, we turn to also uh, writing medical uh, advocate, medical neglect advocacy letters. Um, and with those, we have started to collect the medical records. So our uh, compas or compañeros, compañeras from the detention center will request a copy of their medical records and then um, mail those records to us uh, so that we can see like the multiple times they have requested services, how many times they've been denied services. We highlight that stuff um, so that it is um, sent along with the medical advocacy letters. Uh, we have recently also discovered an organization that FFI referred us to, Doctors for America. And this organization, um, there's doctors who review the medical records and they provide professional insight and evaluation. And so those reviews also can be attached to the medical neglect letters. Um, yes, freedom for immigrants, thank you. To the medical uh, neglect advocacy letters. Um, sometimes these complaint forms are effective in getting individual compas the care they need and the resources they need and to stop whatever neglect or abuse they are experiencing. Many times they are not. However, we believe that it's important to continue to write these complaint forms and these letters uh, because it is a form of officially documenting the abuses. Um, and it lets Core Civic and ICE know that we are watching and that our compas are absolutely not invisible. Um, also, uh, there have been instances where lawyers have asked for copies of these uh, medical advocacy letters um, to submit along with and whatever else their other documentation they're using for parole applications or bond requests. So they support that. Um, we are uh, also, again, we are compiling detailed narratives and evidence uh, that can be used in the future for any individual and collective litigations. So we believe that this is also very much worth our, our time. And of course, we have also 
uh, been recording testimonies from our compas, um, so, sometimes multiple testimonies. Uh, there are compas who have recorded testimonies since back in March, um, narrating their, their circumstances. Um, and let me make sure if there's anything else. Um, so no, I think I, there's so much more in my head, but I have a limited amount of time. So as I'm explaining to you, there's this voice in my head that's tell him this and tell him that. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I'll go over. Um, so uh, currently we have formed a task force um, to try to create a blueprint of best strategies and tactics for launching uh, some sort of medical neglect campaign, something that will uplift the voices of our compas and move beyond just, you know, writing and submitting this medical advocacy letters. Um, and so we're talking to many organizations and looking at all of the work and the evidence that we have in our relationship with the compas. And of course, communicating with our compas um, to see what it is that they want, they want us to do. And so that they, you know, it's always a collaborative effort um, between us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for giving us um, really concrete examples of what's going on inside and, you know, even calling the hotline to share a story like that, I would say is an act of resistance. Um, as you say, these systems are designed to wear people down, to dehumanize them, to encourage them to give up. So reaching out for help, um, demanding that people get the medical care that they need, those are all important acts of resistance. Um, and I would, uh, I will mention this again at the end tonight, but if you're interested in volunteering to be a phone hotline worker, um, like Christina is, um, or uh, getting involved uh, in, in the work of supporting people inside. Um, Detention Resistance is a great organization and they're having an upcoming volunteer orientation on Saturday, March 16th that perhaps we can share the details about in the chat. Um, so with that context, I want to turn next to Vanessa Sasenia who is currently the Director of Capacity Building at Border Angels, a nonprofit that advocates for the just treatment of migrants in the border region. Throughout the years, she has focused on advocating for the needs of the most vulnerable migrant groups, including unaccompanied minors and indigenous migrants from Southern Mexico. Um, Vanessa has a rich, <laughs> rich knowledge base. Um, so there's many things that we could ask you to speak about. Um, two things that I hope that you can touch on. One is um, you've witnessed uh, people inside of Otay Mesa Detention Center and how their experiences um, in the detention center exacerbate mental health conditions. Um, so I hope that you can touch on that. And also you helped to write a report last year about how COVID-19 was compounding the conditions inside um, the detention center. So some combination of touching on both of those things would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, so I don't have to introduce myself because I'm glad she <laughs> reintroduced me um, again right now. Um, and just to add a little bit more to, to that introduction, you know, I am um, from San Isidro. I'm from the border region. This, you know, everything that happens in the borderlands, you know, doesn't affect uh, does directly affect, you know, my community, my family, and all of us. So um, I know that a lot of this work is um, very personal to to a lot of us, and I'm sure to everybody that's, you know, tuning in today. Um, so my formal training is actually in social work. I have a master's in social work, and throughout the years, I've worked as a mental health clinician um, with unaccompanied minors and on legal teams supporting adults that were diagnosed with um, severe mental health illnesses prior to or while in ICE custody. Um, 
I worked with um, or to support uh, folks in detention that were suffering from, um, and just to name a few, um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, which includes audio, tactical, and visual hallucinations, bipolar disorder, um, de developmental disabilities, um, chronic and severe depression, as well as general anxiety disorder, which is called GAD, um, amongst you know other. Um, not only mental health illnesses, but um, also behavioral health issues. Um, and obviously this is all in addition to the trauma that um, you know, almost all migrants um, are faced with it, and many, many other issues that they're you know, faced with during their journey or for those that were already in the US, you know, the trauma of going through um, the really intense um, enforcement that ICE um, conducts when they're arresting folks. Um, so the Otay Mesa Detention Center um, has the capacity to hold uh, 1,142 individuals in ICE custody. This does not count for the um, U.S. Marshal beds. Um, I actually don't have uh, that data with me right now, but we know OMDC holds um, U.S. Marshal detainees and then also those in ICE custody. And based on findings from a report that was issued last year, um, I believe was issued in November um, by ICE's Office of Detention Oversight, and there were around eight main negative findings, meaning that Core Civic was not in compliance with the national detention standards. Um, and if um, any, any of you are not familiar with the detention standards, um, maybe Jesse can put that, somebody can put that in the chat, but it's very easy to Google ICE or immigration detention standards and you are able to um, access the, I think over 700 pages or something um, of this document. So anyways, this report um, that was issued um, by ICE um, last year highlighted three areas within medical compliance that were problematic. And they found that those being prescribed with psychiatric medication were not checked in with regularly. And this is a key compartment or a key part, excuse me, of medication management, which is like the official term of, kind of the process of getting on um, psych medication and, and whatnot. Um, and so for those with severe mental health illnesses, medication may be key to becoming high functioning on a daily basis. Um, however, psych medication can have the opposite effect and it can be very dangerous, even deadly, if it isn't administered or monitored properly. Um, and it was brought to light that medical files were missing prescription consent forms and medication refusal forms, which puts into question, you know, how ICE and Core Civic go um, about issuing psych, psych medications and of course, right, um, all the other medications that Christina was, was mentioning that have nothing to do with mental, um, mental health illnesses. And um, I know Jess mentioned that I, I have actually spent um, quite a bit of time inside um, OMDC, um, not only in like a good part of the facility and the, the medical section, um, but also in the mental health unit. Um, and in OMDC, those with significant mental health illnesses are housed in, in specific areas within the medical unit. Um, there is one space that's referred to as like medical one. Um, it's a large room with small twin sized beds. Um, and then there is also another section with single cells or what's often referred to as solitary confinement with those with you know, higher, um, higher needs. Uh, and many of those individuals are actually in permanent states of psychosis. And then there's what's called a safety cell where individuals that have significant suicidal ideations or suicide attempts are placed in. And when they're in the safety cell, they are being closely monitored. I believe they're monitored 24 seven, um, usually by somebody from the medical staff or licensed clinical social workers or somebody you know, that's there. Um, and when folks are put inside the safety cells, they are, you know, they're not allowed to have any of their personal belongings, of course, and they're not allowed to wear any of their regular um, uniforms or shoes. Um, 
anything like that. They're given um, some type of like medical gown and they're um, made to sleep on a thin mattress on the floor. Um, so in the previous job that I had where I would go into um, the medical, sorry, the mental health units, um, it was to essentially make sure that our clients, which were Franco, what's called Franco class members, um, and those were the folks that we represented. Um, I would, uh, so part of my job was to check in with them regularly. So for some, I would go in uh, maybe once a week, twice, a, um, yeah, bi-weekly or some, honestly, um, it was maybe only once a month because they, there's just a lot of issues and um, some of them just were not really up to receiving um, visits in person. Um, so anyways, um, my job was to basically keep track of their um, behavioral health progress and to um, write any supporting documents that the attorneys could use um, to litigate their case. Um, but for the, the people that you know, didn't um, want to come up to the legal visitation rooms or whatnot, um, I was able to get access um, to the medical or mental health units, um, you know, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so anyways, I would go down there um, essentially to make sure that they were still alive or that their mental health hadn't um, deteriorated in, you know, a lot further than, than we had previously, previously seen before that. And way too many would decompensate or regress so quickly, sometimes from one week to the next. And that was always the hardest part um, of the job was, you know, leaving the facility, knowing that, you know, all of these people that were essentially under kind of our care, under our representation, weren't getting proper, you know, medical care or any of the holistic care that they really needed. Um, we had clients that attempted suicide um, after being released. Um, we would find um, shelters um, that would take them in. And there was um, one case that I remember pretty vividly where um, this person had a lot of audio hallucinations. And when he was in the shelter, um, after being in ICE custody, I believe he was there for at least a year, um, he, he slit his wrists when he was in the shelter. Um, and that in itself, right, just causes obviously a lot more trauma, but then um, as advocates or as social service providers, you know, trying to find proper care, proper treatment for situations like that, it just gets um, a lot more difficult. Um, and there's another case of a man um, who I actually did, um, I would meet with him I think every other week, um, but he was from El Salvador and he had been in the US for a few years and he was initially arrested after entering someone's home during a time when he had experienced um, visual, um, pretty, um, pretty strong visual hallucinations. And in his mind, he was following an angel and this angel led him into somebody's home. Um, those people woke up and called to the cops. That's how he was arrested. Um, and when he was at OMDC, he was heavily medicated. And while I do think that he did need some type of medication, um, it was still very clear that his medication was too strong. Um, under this medication, he couldn't remember basic, basic information. He couldn't remember his wife's name his address, he actually had lived in, um, I believe it was Vista or Oceanside, uh, somewhere in the Northern part of San Diego. Um, and to try to get some of this information from him, we would have him try to, you know, draw out <laughs> maps or streets or whatever it was just to see if we can, uh, we could use something that we can use, you know, to build his um, legal case um, for his release. Um, and those with um, mental health illnesses, even these, um, these individuals that we helped under the, the Franco class settlement, um, they're all um, placed in the same removal proceedings as anybody else. They're not given um, legal representation. For the Franco class members, they were. That's a whole other story though. But if you're not um, classified you know, under that settlement, you know, you would still have to um, represent yourself in deportation proceedings or hire an attorney. Um, 
And so just going back to this man from El Salvador, um, you all can imagine we were going through um, all of this um, preparation and as we were prepping him for his trial or for his merits hearing, he tried slitting his wrists with a pen that I had um, kind of in front of him. Um, and there's a lot of other, you know, stories um, that I can share. I'm more than welcome. I'm more than happy to share, you know, any other details um, about individual cases um, during the breakout sessions or after. Um, but all of this is really hard, right, to take in as advocates, as community organizers, especially as we're trying to figure out the proper strategies um, for you know, getting folks released from detention or whatnot. Um, but I do know, um, even though this work is you know, really challenging um, by collaborating with one another as organizations or individuals, we can really bring light to the countless other violations and injustices that we know exist. Um, behind the walls of immigrant prisons, um, but we might not know about them just yet. Um, and, you know, the organizations like Detention Resistance and FFI, you know, this is why that work is very powerful, because only through, only through those channels do we get to hear, you know, what's really happening, because it's not, these details are not in any of the um, oversight reports, right, that all of these organizations and agencies um, have been issuing, right? So all of this, this data, this, you know, everything that humanizes the this issue is really coming from organizations that are doing the heavy lifting, right? And I'm only gonna, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the, um, the report to that Jess was mentioning because I'm running out of time. But yes, last year when I worked at AFSC, um, us along with Detention Resistance and Pueblos Sin Fronteras did go through um, a lot of um, uh, phone records, interviews or whatnot um, that, were, that we were capturing during the onset of the pandemic and we did um, uh, collect everything, combine everything into a report. And essentially, you know, what we were hearing at that time, this is a year ago almost, right, is essentially the same thing that Christina just shared about, right? So that just shows that even though there was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, focus on detention centers during the pandemic, some folks were able to be released or whatnot, we're still, there still wasn't improvement, right? We're still hearing the same issues. We've heard the same issues, the same complaints from folks in terms of medical neglect or whatnot for years past. So, you know, collectively we have a lot of work ahead of us and I really do appreciate, you know, everybody, everybody here on this call, you know, everybody that does this work day to day. Um, and there really is a role for all of us to play, even if it feels very significant. And that really is how we're, we are going to be able to hopefully one day reach um, true liberation and the closing of all um, immigrant prisons. Um, so I will stop there because I know I ran out of time, but thank you again for, um, for giving me the space to share just a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Vanessa. Oh, I can hear someone's, I'm gonna mute you. <laughs> um, th thank you, Vanessa. Uh, it's hard to hear those stories. Um, and also at the same time, I think you're right that um, without you know, bringing those stories to light outside of the detention center, um, we don't really know the depth of the neglect and abuse that's happening inside and the ways that detention centers traumatize people um, on top of trauma that they're, bring they're bringing from other experiences with Customs and Border Patrol agents or with police in the U.S. or um, all those other layers that people are bringing with them. Um, so it's it's sad and horrifying to hear that um, people are being held in detention with, while undergoing these kinds of experiences. They don't need to be there. There are several people who have the power to let those people out immediately um, to go to their families and communities where they can receive holistic care. Um, so our last speaker tonight is um, Marcela Hernandez. 
Marcella is an abolitionist and feminist organizer. She's an immigrant from Mexico whose family has been impacted by borders, detention, deportation, and criminalization. Currently, she is a, a national senior organizer based out of California with Detention Watch Network, a national network of 130 plus organizations advocating and organizing to abolish immigrant detention. She's been organizing for more than 15 years, including as part of Not One More Movement, ICE Out of LA, ICE Out of California, Justice LA, and the California Dignity Not Detention Coalition. So I'm incredibly grateful that you were able to be with us tonight. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about um, how what Christina and Vanessa just shared fits into some of the national trends and patterns of medical neglect and abuse um, across the country. And also if you can somehow also touch on how people across the country are organizing for their rights and for freedom. Yes, thank you. And it's so great to share space with everyone here. Uh, yes, thank you to Maria and Vanessa, like the work that you all are doing um, and all your local organizations in San Diego are doing is so critical to really right, continue uh, our movement to abolish immigrant detention. Um, and, you know, a lot, we see DWN's work as a contribution to the bigger struggles against racism, xenophobia, policing, and mass incarceration. And we do envision a world where every individual lives and moves freely and a society where racial equality is the norm and immigration is not criminalized. Um, so yeah, today I do wanna touch a little bit about the history of immigration detention, the trends we've seen in the last few years, um, including like the, uh, some of the medical neglect we have seen, where we're at under this new administration, and um, dive a little bit into some of our findings from uh, this report we recently released around uh, how like COVID and detention. Um, and yes, I, I would really like to speak as well as our campaigns um, that were leading to, to abolish immigrant detention um, and how folks can get involved. So yes, for us, the immigration detention system is deadly and violent and needs to be abolished, like I mentioned previously. Uh, really, the roots of detention are due to xenophobic, racist, and anti-Black policies. We saw that in the early 1980s, uh, when thousands of Cuban and Haitian refugees were arriving to the U.S., uh, that's when we saw a lot of the opening of detention facilities. Also, the immigration policy uh, began to maculate the criminal justice system in the late 80s, when we set the height of the war on drugs, which is really like war right on people of color, Congress amended uh, also the Immigration and Naturalization Act to require mandatory detention of immigrants uh, who have been criminalized and given certain convictions. Um, and then also after uh, September 11, we saw that uh, the agency that we had immigration and naturalization services from a service agency, service agency uh, it was divided into um, Immigration Customs and Enforcement, ICE, and Customs and Border Protection, uh, CBP, and then USCIS um, and Immigration Services, which under Trump, we also said they were doing um, enforcement. And then after that, right, under the Obama, so like Trump, right, uh, didn't start detention, it, it was inherited. Under actually the Obama administration, uh, we did see an implementation of a detention bed quota and also an expansion of deportation programs such as 287G, secure communities, the criminal alien program um, that really fueled thousands of immigrants into detention centers. And from Obama to Trump, we saw detention increase uh, from about 38,000 people to a peak of about 55,000 people being detained. Um, so currently we're seeing that ICE operates uh, about 221 uh, detention facilities throughout the US, which is the largest immigrant detention system in the world. Um, and that in 80, about 81% of these uh, facilities are privately run, um, although you know, we do want to emphasize that government run facilities are equally as bad as private facilities. And there's always uh, pervasive economic incentives in both types of detention centers. There's just a lot of uh, companies and corporations, right, that benefit from the incarceration of immigrants and continue to also 
do a lot of uh, lobbying uh, for more detention. And so with that, the government actually wastes more than $25 billion uh, each year on ICE and CBP to profile, jail, and deport our immigrant communities. Um, like folks have said, uh, right, we've seen that uh, since the inception uh, of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, more than 200 people have died in ICE custody. Um, and right now, we are seeing low numbers of people detained, unfortunately, not because of releases, uh, even though like because of local efforts to free them all. Um, and just like a lot of different efforts across the nation, we have seen some releases. Uh, but you know, we are we we are still seeing um, under COVID under the Biden administration, uh, the numbers are low due majorly due to deportations, um, especially that are targeting black immigrants. So right now, um, there's an average daily population of 13 258 folks that are detained, and still we're seeing just rampant abuse right inside of these detention facilities. Um, and where are we? Under Biden, uh, well, he has taken no action on detention. And actually, the new enforcement guidelines and the immigration bill uh, continue to exclude people based on the, you know, their contact with the racially biased criminal legal system, folks who have recently arrived in the country, and incarcerated community members that are at risk of uh, more separation from their families and exposure to COVID and ICE detention. We also continue to see that there uh, giving funding for surveillance at our already deadly US, to the to the already deadly US uh, Mexico border. So yes, um, ICE is plagued with egregious poor conditions and a cultural violence um, that results just in the system wide abuses, uh, including death, as I had mentioned uh, previously. Uh, and we said that, like as folks mentioned before, under COVID this only heightens um, and it also has a very big impact on you know the global health crisis that we're experiencing right now and like folks mentioned you know abuse is long-standing and very well documented thanks to a lot of uh, grassroots groups we have actually given up on asking you know the government to do uh, anything around improving conditions and really just saying you just need right you need to abolish this this detention centers because that the yeah like folks were saying they don't capture everything that's happening here they don't do much about it after these reports are released um and what we are we, what we saw what we're seeing right now what we saw under trump what we saw under obama and previous presidencies is again medical neglect sexual abuse use of solitary confinement which is considered torture physical, verbal, mental, emotional abuse, just very horrific human rights abuses. Um, and I can link some of those uh, reports on the chat after, uh, but three examples that I did wanna share today are uh, that a, probably something that folks heard about a lot last year when uh, you know immigrant women bravely spoke up along a nurse whistleblower to report gynecological procedures, including hysterectomies, um, that were occurring at the Irwin Detention Center in Georgia without informed consent. So just a complete violation of people's reproductive justice rights. And a lot of our members and partners uh, have been organizing for years to uh, release folks from Irwin Detention Center and to shut down that facility. But that's just you know one of the really horrific examples that we have seen. Also um, in fiscal year of 2020, uh, 20 people died in ICE detention including A from COVID. Um, that was the deadliest year in ICE detention since 2005. And under the Biden administration, two people have also already, already died while in immigrant detention. Um, and what we saw during the COVID pandemic, again, ICE refused to respond to calls of detained people, uh, public health experts, advocates, and even federal judges to free folks, halt transfers, and take other precautions to save lives. And we, um, as a result, we have seen how the centers have become hotbeds of COVID-19 infection and actually contributed to an estimated additional 245,000 COVID cases in areas surrounding the detention centers. Um, and at the same time, as folks mentioned earlier, we saw people inside and outside resisting and organizing. 
So actually from March uh, to July of 2020, we recorded about uh, more than, probably more about than 45 hunger strikes taking place inside of detention centers, more than 2,500 people that joined uh, hunger strikes. And this is just hunger strike. There was also other forms of resistance and organizing for from work stoppages, you know, because folks are um, pushed to really, like the conditions that, that this attention center creates, like they push people to work for a dollar a day inside of these attention centers. Uh, folks, you know, were making statements, sending letters, asking folks from the out, you know, uh, from the outside. That, uh, to support them in their call to, to get re released um, from these detention centers. Uh, so yeah, there, that was a lot of information, um, but I do wanna now just talk a little bit more about um, the report that we released. I can post a link if, if folks are interested in getting more information. It's called Hot Bits, how ICE detention contributed to the spread of COVID. Um, so as I mentioned, right, it, they just contributed to a lot more thousands of cases nationally. And we track how ICE responded to COVID. And basically, as I mentioned before, my, ICE refused to uh, listen to the warning, warnings of advocates um, and many other people and even evaded court orders requiring them to reduce numbers. So for example, here locally in California in Adelanto, when advocates were able to obtain an order from the courts that ICE uh, needed to release people from the Adelanto Detention Center, I stood back um, stopping the releases. A Mesa Verde, also a, a detention center in California, ICE purposely rejected uh, universal testing. We also got multiple reports uh, that revealed that those working in ICE detention centers were not wearing uh, PPE. Um, and also, right, we know that folks that work at these detention centers, they travel uh, to their homes, to their communities, potentially introducing the virus both to people uh, in detention and to uh, the, their, like the wider community. Um, in May, officials in uh, Pershaw, Texas, raised the alarm after every local case of COVID-19 could be tracked back to ICE's uh, negligence in South Texas ICE Processing Center. And local ICE officials expressed concern that the GEO Group, which is a company that operates a facility and operates a lot of facilities across the nation, failed to respond to emails and properly keep, uh, keep the community uh, informed about the virus uh, spreading in the facility. Also, again, like folks mentioned before, people detained were not being given adequate access to soap or PPE. ICE was still transferring people. ICE was still the, uh, doing deportations, some folks calling them dead flights, um, and uh, people deported to countries uh, including India, Haiti, Guatemala, El Salvador, tested a positive shortly after their deportation. Um, and also, right, we saw enforcement ramped up uh, under Trump and continue under Biden. Uh, in October specifically of last year, raid, there was a big raid um, and a couple of raids in California that arrested 125 community members. Uh, so yeah, so overall, like uh, some of our findings also were that counties with ICE detention centers were more likely to report COVID cases earlier in the pandemic than counties that uh, without a detention center and yeah, I can paste the, the link to it, but also um, from actually, yeah, uh, AFSC San Diego, who is one of our members, uh, we also uh, got uh, some information that the OTI facility, like in the nearby zip code, has the highest COVID cases in San Diego County. Um, and yeah, in conclusion, right, detention um, really equals a culture of our views of medical neglect of human rights abuses is deadly and unnecessary. And, you know, we really think folks should be outside with their communities. Our, our demands as that folks are released immediately through, uh, you know, freedom of calls across the nation, that there must uh, be a stop to enforcement activities, that their transfers must stop with, with, within immigrant detention centers and from state and local jails. Um, and we have a few campaigns uh, that uh, we lead to abolish immigrant detentions. 
Uh, two of the main ones are Communities Not Cages campaign, where we support more than 23 uh, site fights across the country that are fighting to shut down their local detention center or stop an expansion. We're supporting four states to push anti-detention anti bills, similar to what we did in California. Um, also, uh, there's about more than 37 freedom of efforts, a lot of them led by our members and partners. Um, and we're actually gonna launch a very specific uh, demand to Biden in his first 100 days around detention, demanding that he end uh, that he end 10 contracts in his first 100 de days and commit to ending immigrant detention completely. So we're gonna actually launch that tomorrow. So really invite folks uh, to follow us on social media and uh, share the petition and share uh, the social media graphics we're gonna be put out, putting out there. Two of the facilities are in California, Mesa Verde and Adelanto. Um, and our other avenue where we're really trying to uh, defund ICE and CVP is through our defund hate campaign. So that's through the appropriations campaign. Um, and we have been able to reduce uh, funding this year for more than 10,000 beds. So we were uh, also gonna start that process pushing Biden that in his president's budget, he also commits to uh, facing now immigrant detention. And then that through the budget process, immigrant um, ICE and CVP are defunded. And I can later talk more about uh, California efforts if folks wanna plug in more into like the California efforts, but I know like folks already talked about the amazing San Diego efforts that uh, folks hosting this event are leading. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Marcella, and you packed a lot in in the 15 minutes, um, but also for ending on this call to action, which is where we want to move next in the breakout rooms. Um, so first, let me say, if you have any burning questions for our panelists, please post that in the chat and we'll um, ask them uh, after we do the breakout rooms. Um, but we want to move into a space where folks can have smaller discussion about where do we go with knowing what's happening inside of detention center. Um, so the questions that we have for today are, you know, imagining, one question is about imagining abolition. And if we think about abolition as both a tearing down and a building up, we, the tearing down piece is freeing them all, shutting down detention centers. Um, and the building up question is, what does it look like then to have um, mental health, to have care for all, to have well-being and healing in our communities? And what are some first steps that we can take um, towards building that in our, in our communities um, as we work towards freeing people out of detention? The second question is maybe a more uh, if that feels too abstract to you, maybe this one will feel more concrete. Uh, and that question is, what kind of work do you feel most called to do to support um, the efforts to resist medical abuse and neglect and detention? Um, and the organizations, uh, three organizations represented today, um, talk about different ways that folks might do that. Um, so perhaps you, you, you might want to share what you're feeling called to, to do today. Um, so we have uh, breakout rooms. You should receive an invitation to join one of those breakout rooms, which we uh, invite you to do now. Jess, can you copy paste the questions to the chat? Oh, sorry, I forgot. Here they are. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. I hope that your group discussion was as rich as the one in the breakout room that I was in. We want to have space now for a large group discussion. If, um, if there, first of all, if there are any questions for the panelists, please, um, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to have the panelists ask them. Um, we wanna give time for each of the groups to briefly share um, anything that was especially generative or noteworthy about your conversation. 
Um, so let's start with actually how many breakout rooms were there? There were five. Let's start with breakout room five. Is there someone from that room that wants to share a highlight of your group conversation with us? Okay, no, no one from group five. Uh, I'm not sure if we know our group numbers. <laughs> oh, uh, this one had Evan and Vanessa and and Ella in it. <laughs> yeah, I can I can share a little. Um, I think some of the some of the things that were expressed were. Um, that people were really appreciative of uh, learning, learning some of these things. You know, there's so many accounts of horrific accounts of, of what's going on in, in detention. And, and I think people who were in attendance were, were learning new things that they, they didn't know happened inside. And, um, and also people were learning of just like the networks uh, that exist of different organizations um that um that that's also very powerful you know um and we talked about the methods of of how people report these things you know um some of what christina and vanessa shared uh about you know doing the the reports that they submit to dhs and um, we kind of reflected on that um trying to remember <laughs> Um, does anybody else want to chime in <laughs> on what was what was shared? I kind of, I I guess I I like to because it, it was a lot, right? What everything that was um, talked about at this this event is is pretty heavy. So I think it's also good to to kind of come together and and just like at least just share like what what that made you feel and not just talk about things so, so objectively, but um, let, letting these kinds of conversations be something that you just, um, you take in, you know, you don't let it just kind of um, in, in be, be human about it, you know? Um, so, so yeah, anybody else in the group wanna, wanna share? kind of their thoughts summarize things. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that Vanessa had brought up when we were talking is like um, what happens to people who especially who are dealing with, you know, serious mental health issues um, if they're released and the complexities of that. And so um, it sort of really illuminates kind of the problems with the the system, like the larger social systems that we don't have the capacity to, to, to care for and, and support people because of, um, you know, right, inadequate like housing and capacity to deal with people um, because of borders and like, like the concept of citizenships and all of these kinds of things. And so that there's a lot of, a lot of complexities there that are really hard to, to work with. Thank you all for that. Um, I'm actually going to skip to my group and then I'll come back to you group four. But we had um, uh, a person in our group, Eve, who actually recently got out of detention and is also a doctor. So had some really good insight and wanted to um, give him some space to talk about some things that didn't come up in the main presentation. Are you willing to talk, Eve? Um, I say again, good evening, everybody. I would like to introduce myself. Uh, yes, for the people that they, I'm a newcomer in this meeting. My name is Ives Kaduli. I am from Congo, Africa, Democratic Republic of Congo. I 
immigrant that I was being released, it passed exactly three weeks. I was being detained for long in Wind Correctional Center, Louisiana. So I'm 35 now years old and I'm doctor, general practitioner, and I have experience in infectious and tropical disease. So like the immigrant or better say asylum seeker and being detained for a long time, I, I am interested to talk about uh, medical problem or medical issue with in detention center. Yes, I know you are activists, you are lawyer, you are person that's are involved in, to help immigrants. And when they are talking about mental health and all the abuse, I think like that one who was being detained for long and I have medical problem, I have high blood pressure. And until now I continue to take um, medicine about anxiety because until I will go to see the doctor and the appointment in order to change if I'm really good. So I think I'm the one I can add earlier in my experience and, and my history in detention center to give and to share to you in order to take this testimony or declaration to post and to share, to share like that evidence that can help all the immigrants or to change the system. The immigration system, detention center is not to help. It adds again traumatism in the people from outside in detention center, you be, we became sick. I didn't have any problem, but being detained, I leave from detention center with high blood pressure. And now I have some complication on my heart. Allow me to say it, they call it delay of conduction and block. So it's me that I'm young before I can play basketball, or soccer or run away, but now I cannot support more than work, more than one hour doing the exercise, no, because they did and I keep my medical records for legal activity, for example. So it means that that is not the problem. Now I say thank you very much to call me and to participate in this meeting. I yeah, discover and I know that you are working, you continue to work until the goal is to arrive in a position of the detention center of immigrant. Yes, maybe it can take time, but it will arrive. And I wish and the desire. It's not the revelation, it's not the prophecy, but the thing that you are doing, it will arrive. Because I know in the world, I passed through in the different country. They not keep immigrants in the detention center or prison. If you put in the camp, it can have a little bit the sense, but no prison, no detention center. They change the world in order to, to, to try to manage the story or the policies. So that is, I, I, I wish to see the immigration system specifically in the detention center to change. That is the better. Because you cannot say you are going to help someone in the same context, in the same time. You are doing something that impact negatively in his body. Some people leave from detention center with medical health. They cannot walk because they have some problem. You were talking about, yes, Corona and everything. Yes, even outside, even inside. But the problem is not the same. When someone is in his family, family can take care of him, relax. And specifically when we're talking mental health, in the brain, the psychological, being in detention center is more than, is more than 
the blow that they can give you outside. No, the stress is permanent. Every day, sometimes no sleep. Uh, so it's very, very sad. Even the medicine that they give sometimes to see if they can control, because the goal is to give you some pill in order to sleep, sleeping pills. Okay, that is good. But until when? Being you are determined, they force you to take that medicine in order to control. Okay, say so because if you pass a long time sleeping, so you cannot. But in the end, there is some interaction, association that is no good with medication of anxiety, stress, and other mental disorder, with other problem of, of, of health like that, high blood pressure. There is some association that is no good specifically for the medicine that they give against the stress or depression with the foods that they give in detention center. When you, 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 you eat for a long time, taking medicine, the food based on the cheese specifically, you can ask for other commentary with other professional health. The cheese have some substance. They call it, how they call it in English. Uh, I'm sorry, my main language is French. So uh, they call it tiramine. It's like that protein. Yeah. Okay. That protein, when you are taking medicine against depression, no have a good association. So it became toxic in your body and it can increase again high blood pressure, for example. That is common, more people that are suffering that high blood pressure, high blood pressure. And you're going to discover they're taking also medicine against anxiety or depression. So there is some commentary that uh, is not one factor that we must to mix or to add some condition in order to, to understand some uh, medical disorder or the problem or abuse or prescription that our, my colleague, sometime uh, they do it. I don't know why, why? Because we are immigrants, we are detained. So uh, I have some reserve to talk about my colleague, the doctor. But the policy is not correct. Is we need, or we need to do something, or to change, uh, to bring some change in that policy, or to see that only immigrants in detention center. This, the thing that is easily uh, anxiety, anxiety, distress. Yes, but what is the problem? Is to be free, is to go outside. No matter the condition, no matter the the condition that you are they decide to take you outside. But while you are in detention center under this stress and pressure, you will have that problem and it can increase or the organic problem that can have the consequence for a long time in your life. So uh, that is a brave, I would like to add only that commentary about uh, mental health and abuse or prescription in detention center. Yes, it exists. And we need with you, with other authority, that authority of this country, that they have acknowledged all this, the problem to bring the new area so people they can breathe the hope in this immigration process. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for sharing your testimony. I think it really highlighted the ways that detention is making people sick, literally, um, aging people, um, bringing conditions that people might not experience until they're much older into, into young people. Um, so it's really powerful testimony. And I'm right with you that the solution is abolition and letting people out. There's no way to provide medical care um, to people inside if they're actively being made sick by being in detention. So thank you so much for your testimony. And also I wanted to highlight a point that someone made in the chat about, um, there's also this question of aftercare and if prisons are making, um, detention centers are making people sick, prisons also make people sick, then how are we 
um, going to provide care for people once they're released um, is, is uh, another question. Um, so we have just a, a, a few more minutes left. Is there anyone from any of the other rooms that wanted to um, share anything that was really impactful about your discussion? Hi, I'd like to share something if uh, there's, I'll, I'll be quick. <laughs> uh, I was in breakout room number two. Um, hi everyone, I'm Priscilla Higuera. I'm an immigration attorney. Um, and I was in breakout room number two. We had a wonderful breakout session um, and we were able to kind of just kind of uh, float the idea of working with physicians. We had Casey who was in our group. She is a physician uh, down in Chula Vista and we were hoping to kind of create this, um, maybe some sort of coalition with physicians who treat detainees in terms of documentation, documenting CBP's treatment of the detainees. Um, while it may not be, you know, your, your typical medical um, annotation, um, you know, any sort of lack of phone access, or even if we just add per CBP after everything, right? So no telephone access per CBP no whatever per CBP. Um, those things are actually super beneficial to us on the advocacy side when we're, you know, when it's time to request bond or parole or uh, any sort of release. And so um, Casey and I have exchanged some info and we're hoping to start some sort of underground movement <laughs> between physicians and uh, activists. Um, so if anyone is working with physicians or, um, anyone who can document CBP's treatment of the detainee, um, it will absolutely help us when it's time for us to make those bond and parole requests. That is amazing. And I'm going to put the email for detention resistance in the chat for any, I know there are many physicians um, both working inside and outside. Um, and we would love to, uh, I know the folks on the detention resistance medical abuse and neglect task force would love to connect with you and collaborate with you. Um, so I just put the email in the chat if um, any, any of the physicians or medical workers or folks who are moved to um, do take action like you're suggesting, please get in touch. Um, all right, any of the other groups who wanted to report back? Okay. Um, I would love to say just one quick thing. I don't wanna to take too much time. I think this is a meeting of the most brilliant of minds. So it's always scary to, to unmute yourself, but um, we had a great, great meeting um, with, with just a lot of rich conversation. We talked briefly about the Biden administration and what they, you know, haven't been doing and kind of what the, the pushback is looking like. And then, um, well, one thing that I wanted to say just to respond to Priscilla, it's not in the same vein, but I guess similarly, um, I had kind of some late night abolition thoughts so, um, about how cool it would be to see social workers who were abolition minded because obviously there's a lot of problematic behavior in social work, but social workers who were abolition minded on the street or like supporting these people, you know, we talked that one of the questions in the chat was what do we do with these individuals in the in the post process and obviously a lot of them need medical care, but a lot of them need counselor immediate mental health support right and it would be so cool to see a coalition where there wasn't like a six to six, six week to six month wait list for them to get into a counselor's chair, but rather this, you know, individuals who had these degrees that were willing to immediately meet with these individuals and so it sounds like similar to what you were dreaming up in in more of like the physician mindset but i definitely um yeah i think a lot about just like moving forward i have a lot of crazy big ideas like i dream of a campus like an abolition minded campus in san diego where like everybody could go for all resources but at the end of the day i just wish that there was more ways to incentivize individuals who are in their personal lives abolition minded in their professional lives they have an that is valuable whether that be psychology whether that be you know social work a physician law and just see more people applying these really sought after 
after things in just that way of like, hey, let me be in community with you. Let me offer you, you know, um, even if it's just as like a friend, but you're a counselor. So you're gonna be talking like a counselor, you know? And so that's kind of one, one thing that came to mind when I was hearing you talk. Um, and then I did have a couple other questions, but I forgot them, but I just wanted to, I wanted to contribute that. And I was thinking like, wouldn't it be cool to see something so holistic where it was like, a, you know, I never wanna say one-stop shop, but something where like, if you need a doctor, you have a doctor. If you need, you know, a counselor, you have a counselor. If you need a, you know, and it's not so heavily bought because we talk, um, my experience is through the lens of foster care, which I have a, I have a controversial opinion that foster needs to be abolished, but um, I have, I, I mean, I've experienced so much pain with um, my, I've had 13 foster children and I've literally never seen a family not love their children and not deserve their children back. Um, I have two adopted children. I'm still very close with their families and they've all been impacted by this work. So um, my point is, is that I see a lot of these issues of what we call barriers. And I heard that used earlier tonight and I really appreciated the overlap of like, you know, these communities, the barriers are just so astronomically high from an anthropological perspective we're asking people who have never experienced the sort of Americanized assimilation to effectively perform at this really high level of you know being the American being the nuclear family being whatever is you know seen as but my point is is just that I'm seeing a lot of overlap with these communities rather they be prison detention centers, foster system, whatever. We're asking too much of the individuals who are victims of these systems and the barriers are way too high. So I think the, the question I pose that I leave you know, my thoughts with is just like, how do we lower the barriers? How do we get these individuals in a community setting to you know, support them as quickly as possible, if that makes sense? Thank you, Ellie. And I saw that Marcella would like to speak. But yeah, also just like on, I think that's such a great idea, Ellie, and I did a plug for the Latinx Therapist Network, who's actually uh, doing some of that work with us, uh, with our leaders that, you know, have organized inside of detention or are organizing outside and our members that have been released. So i um, happy to connect you all to them for like a model. Um, and also I did want to make a plug for more like, uh, for folks that are based in California, for like, things that are moving specifically in California. So there is uh, the California Dignity Not Detention Coalition that's leading a lot of the work against detention um, in California and passed a few bills uh, against detention here. Right now, they're also supporting the efforts with CURVE uh, for an initiative called Budget to Save Lives, which basically really pushes for defunding the incarceration system in California and investing all of the money into services, including for immigrant communities uh, and folks that are being released from uh, prison jails. Um, and also they're uh, pushing an end to transfers via like demanding the governor take action. And there's also uh, a bill being introduced uh, called the Vision Act that would basically uh, make a lot that they can't transfer folks from jails and prisons to ICE custody. So I just wanted to also make a plug for that if folks wanna, you know, just follow them. And just if you have like five minutes of your day, you know, to check out like their their uh, Facebook page or like DWNs, we have so many calls to action. And if folks just wanna take five minutes out of their, their day, it could go a long way to just uh, take those actions to get us closer to, to the vision of not having these cages and that our communities are prioritized. Thank you so much, Marcella. And this is a great, the last few minutes we wanted to actually devote to calls to action and ways for people to plug in. So thanks for transitioning us to that. Um, uh, the national campaigns that Detention Watch Network um, is organizing are excellent ways to plug in. There are also local um, ways to plug in. Uh, uh, I will put some information in the chat about Detention Resistance is having a uh, volunteer training coming up on March 6th. They especially need folks to volunteer to answer those calls from people who are calling from detention. Um, and they need folks to help support people once they've been released. Um, so 
I know that was a, a question about how to support people once they've been released. One way to do that is to, by volunteering for detention resistance. If you'd like to learn more, check out uh, the information there. Uh, also, this event's been hosted by Free Them All San Diego. We are planning to have a town hall meeting in the next few weeks to discuss uh, next steps for our organization. We started as an ad hoc organization to respond to um, COVID-19 crisis and we're um, moving in a new direction. So if you'd like to hear more about our next campaign to free them all, um, stay tuned. You can follow us the best places on our Instagram account. Um, there's also a Facebook if you're really old fashioned like me and can't figure Instagram out. Um, so I'll put that in the chat. Um, are there any other quick calls to action that any of our panelists or coalition members want to post before we end tonight? I had, <laughs> I had a quick question, Jess. Sorry, I. Um, it sounds like you're doing some stuff on Facebook still. I know Facebook is like weirdly <laughs> like, well, I mean, I like Facebook. I feel like it's really hard to connect on Instagram and have those like dialogue, that dialogue. Is that dialogue happening over on Facebook, would you say? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Um, but it is a way to connect with us and okay. we do post our events and things okay. there. So I believe that there. <laughs> that's a question for another political education seminar. Um, <laughs> should we be using these platforms? Um, thank you so much everyone for your presence tonight. And um, I hope that some of you are leaving inspired to plug in if you haven't before or to rejoin if you've gone away. Um, I, I'm certainly feeling that way. Um, so, uh, and I hope I didn't miss any questions in the chat, um, but thank you so much and uh, looking forward to learning more with you again in the future. Bye everybody.